Good afternoon, dear friends and colleagues. It's my privilege to welcome you to this symposium on innovation in mitral and tricuspid repair and replacement. In these times of misery, it appears as if uh, the pandemic overrules all other aspects of medicine, including cardiovascular medicine. However, we have seen and witnessed that patients with cardiovascular disease who are COVID positive are those who suffer most and have a really severely depressed prognosis. I just would like to take this opportunity to uh, show you some of the most recent data which were collected by uh, Dani Dwyer and showed on TCT this year, uh, showing that um, in this cohort of more than 130 patients, there were quite a substantial number of patients um, who had severe AV valve disease. All these patients were COVID positive. And there are two aspects which are of interest. One is that basically none of these patients uh, were operated on or received valve repair. Um, and the second um, aspect is, and this is very sad, uh, that the prognosis of these patients is particularly bad. You can see this here, regardless of uh, the etiology of, of valve disease, 30-day um, mortality ranged between 30 and 55%, which indicates uh, the importance of diagnosis and therapy of patients with this disease, perhaps even more in these times of the pandemic. I'm very privileged to show you the faculty which is around all uh, very experienced interventionalists and operators who will lead us through the possibilities we have so far for transcatheter treatment of tricuspid and mitral valve disease. We will start off with Dr. Arnold on direct annuloplasty we will uh, get a nice overview on edge-to-edge -edge repair by uh, Dr. Lurz and Jörg Hausleiter will uh, show us um, current evidence of treatment of tricuspid regurgitation and potential roles of tricuspid valve replacement. The backbone of all of what we have to discuss today is a large body of studies which have uh, been initiated by Edwards to prove that these therapies indeed improve prognosis and safe. And uh, you can see the, here that there are five pivotal trials on the way, feasibility studies as well as post-marker studies, which will help us to define who is actually the one who should receive which therapy. We started off with direct annuloplasty um, provided by Edwards Life Science. We then were introduced to the Pascal repair system and we are currently witnessing uh, the launch of the Pascal A system. And I think we should have the possibility to discuss the implications of these therapies throughout our symposium. And without further words, I'd like to give uh, the microphone to Dr. Arnold on his talk for annuloplasty with cardioband tricuspid system tackling the root cause of tricuspid regurgitation. Dr. Arnold, please. Thank you, Professor Baldus, for this kind introduction. It's a great pleasure for me that I have the role to introduce the cardioband tricuspid system to you. These are my disclosures. The cardioband tricuspid valve system is a dedicated system which allows annular reduction or direct annuloplasty by catheter-based therapy. There's a similar system which is made for mitral valve repair, but the tricuspid valve system is a dedicated system and it allows real-time adjustment of the tricuspid annulus and the confirmation of the procedural results. I would like to give you an update on the dry repair study, which was the very first study that's summarizes the very first clinical evidence or clinical experience with the cardioband tricuspid system. And it was conducted in eight pioneering centers throughout Europe, and they included 30 patients into this study. There were already the acute results published, the six months results were presented, and the one year follow-up data were presented, and now we have two year data from this study. Initially in the study, 30 patients were included and the follow-up was completed in 24 patients and the two-year data uh, are about 20 patients. 
And the main endpoint was the technical success, and this was defined in this study uh, by effectively positioning the cardio band in the tricuspid annulus and by achieving a reduction of the septal lateral diameter of the valve. And with the cardio band tricuspid system, it was able to achieve a significant reduction of the septal lateral diameter acutely. And as you can see on this chart, uh, this effect persisted over the two years follow-up. And this, again, translated in a significant reduction of tricuspid regurgitation, and also this effect persisted over the two-year follow-up. And the most important uh, fact, especially in this cohort of patients, which were all not candidates for other types of therapies, is that their clinical uh, effects or the, the clinical effect was significant. So the NIHA classification significantly improved, and also the quality of life, which is measured by the KCCQ score, was significantly better. And also, this effect persisted over the two year follow up period. With regard to survival, um, after two years, um, more than 70 patients, 70% 70 of those patients were alive. Um, acutely during the 30 day procedure or during the procedure, no death occurred. So, let me show you. One of our cases that we did in early 2019, uh, we recorded the case at that time. It was a 77 years old female patient. And this also corresponds very well to the trial repair study where the average age was around 76 years. Uh, she was symptomatic with dyspnea. She had a functional TR, obviously. And it was, as we would call it now, a massive TR. This is the transesophageal echo image before the procedure. You see the leaflets and you see the amount of regurgitation. And you would agree that this is a significant tricuspid regurgitation. There are five different sizes available, um, depending on the length. And there's a lot of pre-procedural measurement done, and from the CT we do for planning, uh, we choose the appropriate band. This is the system. It consists of three parts, a sh steerable sheath, a guide catheter, and the inner catheter, which holds the cardio band. Uh, we initially placed it into the superior vena cava, just to have a starting point from there. On the right screen, you see that there is a guiding catheter on the ostium of the right coronary and a guide wire in place, just for orientation. And this is one of the anchors which are used to attach the cardio band to the tricuspid annulus. It looks like a screwdriver and it's around eight millimeters long. And this is how to identify the starting point. Um, you place the catheter tip on the anterior lateral aspect of the ring and measure the distance from the uh, aortic, the centrum of the aortic valve. You can confirm the appropriate position by fluoroscopy and also by echocardiography. And you can also confirm the position by 3D transesophageal echo. And this is where you start. The anchor is screwed in. You do a pull test, and then a little bit more of the cardio band is re released from the inner catheter. And the next anchor is placed there after the optimal position is confirmed by echo. That means you move a little bit more lateral along the course of the tricuspid annulus, close to the hinge point of the leaflet. And if the position is confirmed again in echo, you deploy the second anchor there. You can see it on the lower left panel, the tip of the catheter right at the hinge point of the tricuspid valve. And this is the position where you want to place your anchors. And depending on the size of the band, you have to implant up to 17 anchors. Um, and you can also confirm the appropriate position on fluoroscopy and the guide wire in the right corner, uh, right corner artery is a very helpful landmark. And this is how you make your way around the tricuspid annulus. Um, you can see the radiopaque markers, which um, depict the different segments of the cardio band. And at the end, um, after deploying 
up to 17 anchors as mentioned before um, you have completed attaching the band to the tricuspid annulus you do an proper pull test again because the last anchors are very important for the stability of the system. You see this pull test on the right panel and after that and confirmation and echo the implant catheter is detached from the cardioband and our little guide wire the so-called size adjustment tool is connected to this little round part which you can see on the fluoroscopy to the so-called spool this system allows to contract the band by shortening the wire which is in the band and therefore you achieve this direct annular plastic by reducing the perimeter of the annulus you can contract the band up to 5.5 centimeters and while you're doing this step by step gradually reducing the length of the carpet band you can watch the effect on the echo image and see the reduction of the tricuspid regurgitation. In the beginning, you see this massive tricuspid regurgitation, and the final, the final results you see uh, not more than moderate tricuspid regurgitation in this case. Also, on fluoroscopy, you can nicely appreciate how the band was contracted and you see that the anchors are, have come close together. Um, you have to check the right coronary artery if you create some. Uh, geometric changes of the right coronary artery, some bands or kinks, um, which are usually just transient uh, if they are there. Um, and if you have any flow limitations, you're able to um, release some contraction, wait for a while and contract the band again. And usually this is enough to cope with this, such issues. And this is the final result comparing the echo images before the procedure and after. Um, and you see the, the nice effect of the treatment of the cardioband system of the tricuspid valve. So what more do we know um, after this initial study? Uh, we are about to collect the, the real, early real-world experience. Uh, we have collected up to 60 consecutive patients, which were treated in four German centers, but in Hausen, Cologne, here in Erlangen, in Göttingen. Um, and the data from those patients were collected between October 2018, when the system received the CE mark in Germany, uh, until early um, February 2020. And the difference, um, obviously, to the initially tri repair study is that the experience or the, the share of each center was at least 10 patients um, per center. So we have data on 60 consecutive patients. The median age is comparable to the uh, age in the tri repair study. Also, the risk score is similar, but there was some difference. And this also reflects the real world characteristic of, of the study, um, because in the initial tri repair study, patients who had transfallible pacemaker leads were excluded. Um, and in our registry, we had 10% of patients who had pacemaker leads in place. Um, also, patients on chronic hemodialysis were included in the study. And uh, which one fact which was a very hard exclusion criteria in the tri repair study was the proximity of the right coronary artery. Um, and during the course of our registry, we simply omitted this fact as an exclusion criteria uh, for treating patients with the cardioband system. Um, so we looked um, at the anatomy during the, the planning phase, but we did not exclude patients who had a very close proximity of the right coronary artery to the trichospinalis from the treatment with this type of technology. So what, do you, what we could see is that we were effectively treating patients with the cardioband system so we were able to significantly reduce the severity of the tricuspid regurgitations in most of the patients and were able to reduce it uh, to a level or to a grade of uh, mild or moderate in at least 60 percent of those patients and this was acutely seen and also at the time point of 30 days in those patients. And this also translated into the functional status of the patients. They improved um, significantly, significantly um, more than 80% were on NYHA class uh, one or two after the treatment. And what is one really interesting point, and this is why I already pointed out the, the different numbers uh, which uh, the different centers contributed to the different studies. Um, in the tri repair study, the, the average was around four to five patients uh, for each center. 
Um, and in, in our real world registry, we had at least 10 patients uh, contributing to, to this study. And if you look at the procedure times and you look at the learning effects, you see that um, after the initial 10 cases, there's not much, or during the initial 10 cases, there's not much change with regard to the uh, procedural times. But after the, the initial 10 cases, you see a dramatic drop in procedural time. Um, and you see that the procedural time is already cut by half. So let me just conclude. Um, there's a group of patients with functional tricuspid regurgitation out there which has an unmet need for treatment. Um, and the treatment options are limited and the cardioband tricuspid system is one option which can be offered to those patients. And as seen uh, in the studies, there is a significant reduction of the severity um, by this therapy. And this uh, lasts at least over two years. Um, the survival rate in those patients, and you have to say that those patients are the ones with uh, higher comorbidities, so that they were thought to be candidates for interventional therapy and not for open heart surgery, is up to seven or more than 17 percent. And which is more important for those very sick, ill patients is that they have a tremendous improvement in the functional status and quality of life. And we were able to see or to reproduce this. Um, findings from the initial studies in our real world data. I just wanted to, to go back to this initial slide that Professor Baldus already showed. Um, we are currently using the very first cardio band system, um, which was introduced in 2015. Um, but there is a lot of development already done by Edwards Life Sciences, and the next generation of the system is already on its way. Um, and I can tell you what, what I've seen so far. It will definitely improve the procedure itself and will help to reduce the procedural times dramatically, and also will expand the number of patients who are uh, candidates for this kind of therapy. Thank you very much for your attention. Yeah, dear colleagues, uh, welcome. Now we are live on behalf of the panel. I'd like to cordially welcome you to this uh, interactive uh, symposium here on atrial, atrial ventricular valve disease and its in its treatment. Uh, Martin, thanks so much for, for this very nice uh, introduction to the symposium and this interesting and, and very well done case on uh, the cardioband system used in a patient with tricuspid regurgitation. In fact, all of you are welcome to send us questions. We have Fabian Pras in the background who is uh, providing us with your questions and uh, we'd like to discuss them here um, in the panel. Maybe I'm, I, I can start. Uh, Martin, you showed very impressively how you were able to reduce tricuspid regurgitation using direct annuloplasty. I mean, in some cases, in some patients, we witness that um, uh, the, the, the band is not long enough and uh, cannot be used. Um, any ideas on how to, to perform uh, in, in these cases? Well, actually, what we found out is that um, even if the official parameters are too large for using the cardioband system, we found out that during the procedure itself, we already do some contraction on the analyst, and therefore we are able to treat patients which have officially large analy that rec which, uh, in contrast to those which are recommended for the cardioband treatment itself. Um, we will be able with upcoming generations of the cardioband um, to treat patients with larger NLI because the system will provide that. Um, and as said before, um, due, during the procedure, step by step, we are already reducing with every anchor that we are implanting the pre-existing length of the tricuspid analyst, and therefore we are definitely already able to treat larger NLI than um, those uh, what, what is recommended on the official um, IFU or sizing chart. Uh, Philip, perhaps a question for you. Thank you. Philip, perhaps a question for you. Um, if you have such a situation, could leaflet repair using the Pascal system in the first place be an alternative to then shrinking the annulus in a way that then the cardioband would work as well? Absolutely. I mean, that, that concept and the idea is out for... Um, for, for, for quite a while, it could also be done the other way around, starting with annular reduction and then using leaflet approximation 
um, techniques um, after you reduced uh, the gap. Um, from a pathophysiological point of view, that makes terrible sense. I think the problem is that combining these two procedures makes everything very complex, maybe too long. So you, you might want to do it in, in a stepwise wise approach. And obviously reimbursement for the, these two procedures also is a little bit difficult. But um, from a technical point of view, um, it makes terrible sense to combine annular reduction and leaflet approximation. Jörg, one, one question um, which came up was when I saw these data on the learning curve. I mean, is this your experience as well? Is this the same for leaflet repair, the learning curve? Um, or or what, what are your thoughts on this? Well, I think um, everybody who starts in the tricuspid field um, will have a significant learning curve um, at the interventionalist, but also the echocardiographer. And um, the cardioband procedure is a procedure where you need a lot of good echo images. You need to know where you're going to put in the anchors. Um, so there is a significant uh, learning curve. You can get faster. It is important that you have the, a good echo machine which supports you in, in this. But uh, overall, yes, I think uh, for all those techniques, there is a significant learning curve and you get better over time. Martin, one last question for you. In case you have a, a, a failed procedure, this came up in the chat, um, after cardioband with significant remaining uh, tricuspid regurgitation, can you do a valve in ring in this situation? Um, actually, I, I don't know if I'm allowed to answer this question. I think there will be some options that are coming up that will solve exactly this issue. All right. Okay, we will we will discuss this later then, I guess. Okay, thanks, Martin. Thanks so much for was a very nice presentation. And I guess we, we move on from direct annuloplasty to leaflet repair. Uh, Philipp Lutz from Leipzig will give us an overview uh, of this technique of the Pascal system and the new Pascal ACE for tricuspid regurgitation. Philipp, please. Thank you very much for the introduction and for the opportunity to discuss with you the Pascal system and the ACE device to treat tricuspid regurgitation. The Pascal platform comes with two different devices and they differ in terms of size. The Pascal device with a width of um, 10 millimeter and um, as compared to that, the smaller device, same length but different with the Pascal ACE device, six millimeter. Both devices, share the distinct features of the Pascal system, including a central spacer, um, conduit pedals, the ability to perform independent leaflet capture, and both devices are nitinol based with a passive closing mechanism. Now, when we treat tricuspid regurgitation by transcatheter means, a couple of distinct anatomic features have to be considered. First, we are maneuver in a quite busy subvalve apparatus with very dense cordae. Secondly, the leaflets are thin, they are see-through, and to some extent they are fragile, so we have to be very atraumatic with what we are doing. And then thirdly, quite often we are confronted with um, severe dilatation and also increased leaflet uh, cooptation gaps. Now, one potential advantage of the Pascal system is the fact that this system is a nitinol-based device with um, a passive um, grasping mechanism, and it allows to open and close slightly during the heart cycle, closing in systole, and opening during the last diastole when there is load on the leaflets and on the device. Something which has not been acknowledged that much in the past, but is more and more important, is the fact and the recognition that the leaflets are more durable at the central part, the more you move towards the annulus, which means that it is important that during grasping, that central part of the leaflet is also included within the device and the Pascal has horizontal, 
um, retention elements, which are supposed to grasp the leaflet exactly at that central part away from the line of cooptation where the leaflets might be more fragile. And then lastly, independent leaflet grasping, a feature which is quite important on the tricuspid valve. In this movie, this is illustrated with one leaflet being captured first and then the device is um, swinged over to the other leaflet and either in this case as an as a, um, independent grasping or as a leaflet optimization maneuver as shown here, making sure that the whole length of the leaflet is part of the grasping. We now continue with um, a life in the box case, demonstrating how these specific features can be used to treat tricuspid regurgitation. We treated an 83 year old man who presented to us with worsening of uh, dyspnea, NYHA class 223, he had peripheral edema and one episode of heart failure hospitalization um, three years ago. His left ventricular ejection fraction was reduced 45%. He was known to have coronary artery disease with um, previous history of myocardial infarction. He has chronic persistent AFib and some degree of reduced kidney function. He is on the following medication, including some heart failure medication and 30 milligrams of tyrosamide. You can see the patient's coronary angiogram with no significant lesions and no um, need for intervention. You can see the um, transesophageal echocardiogram. On the left, you can see a transgastric view sitting in the right ventricle, looking up towards the tricuspid valve. And you see that there is in a central cortation if it extending from anteroceptally to postroceptally with a very broad tricuspid regurgitant jet, which is at least massive on that view. Calculated right ventricular pressures were on echo 24 millimeters of mercury and invasively 35 millimeters of mercury. And um, here additional inf information on that patient, six minute walking test, almost 400 meters, but he had really severe shortness of breath. Um, his anti P is markedly increased and his risk scores um, are illustrated here, especially given the age of the patient, but the decision in the heart team was that the patient is best treated by a transcatheter approach. So we performed this case in the heart team together with my friend and colleague Chief Moa, cardiac surgeon. You can here again appreciate on a transgastric view the cooptation defect in the center but extending from anterior to posterior and you can also see that it appears that that valve consists of more than three leaflets. So on color, the TR jet really extending along the entire length of the commissure. The strategy here required some discussion, but we eventually came up with a decision to place the first device anteroceptally and hoping thereby reducing the anatomy and not only the, the TR jet anteroceptally, but also at the center. Interprocedurally, TR was graded as grade five, which means torrential. There was no gradient to start with. We, we previously did an analysis looking at tricuspid valves, which appear to have four leaflets or even more, and we found that procedure success is still higher than 80%, but a little bit lower than as compared to patients with three leaflets, and that's something which needs to be considered when in, um, approaching these patients and also for consenting. So we were faced with a slightly more difficult anatomy. We placed the device on top of the tricuspid valve, making sure that we have an orthogonal trajectory of the device in two different planes. We checked for the clasps, brought them down independently in case independent leaflet grasping is needed, and then guided by echocardiography, crossed the tricuspid valve 
and place the device in the right ventricle. We always do that with the device being closed to make sure that we might not get entangled in any cords in the tricuspid valve. We then check for the position. We wanted to, imply, to implant the first device anteroceptally. We can then appreciate on transgastric views that the device is in the correct position between the anterior and septal leaflet. Only then we open the device and ask echo to stay at the level of the co-optation of the leaflets. And then we bring back the device into the echo view, making sure that we are in the right position, that we do not lose the position, and also assessing whether we manage to engage the leaflet on the device. So we pull back the device now and also make sure that the clocking is correct. So the device clocking orientation should be 90 degrees to the line of cooptation. Using the second plane, we can appreciate how far we are in the right ventricle. And you can see that we're still below the valve. So we have to come back even further, which we do now. And then on the left, you will in a second be able to recognize the device coming up into the echo plane as it is. Now we are sort of 90 degrees, three to nine o'clock fashion of the device. And you can see that the leaflets, both the anterior and septal, are moving less, which indicates that these leaflets are nicely on the device. On a mid shield view, we then have the chance to make sure that both leaflets are nicely in, that they touch the center of the, of the, um, of the spacer, the apex, which we could see nicely. Both clasps are then brought down at the same time, and the device is closed slowly, watching on echo both the leaflets and the appearance of the device. And you can see that while closing, we introduced some tension on the leaflet, which indicates good grasping length. And that was the view on transgastric with already quite a marked reduction of tricuspid regurgitation, not only anteroceptally, but also in the central part of the valve. So here you can see the comparison of the tricuspid regurgitation on color before and after implantation of the first device. And you can appreciate that we reduced tricuspid regurgitation um, quite markedly and frankly, even more than we expected at that point in time. We then had a discussion on how to proceed, um, but we're sure that we certainly release the device where um, it is and then have the discussion whether we should implant a second device afterwards. So the, the lines are then um, removed the device is released and the result again assessed. We had reduction in right atrial pressures. We can see that both, both leaflets are nicely in the anterior and the septal. And we still had some tricuspid regurgitation, but um, already reduced from grade five to grade two, as you can appreciate here. However, we thought that um, it is still possible to do better, and therefore we decided to implant a second device also between anterior and septal leaflet to reduce the anatomy even, even more so. What's important to realize here is that we implanted one device anteroceptally, but we also reduced tricuspid regurgitation at the area of posteroceptally. So that's something we quite often see by if you get a good grasp, we reduce the anatomy and thereby we reduce tricuspid regurgitation, not only at the point of the implant, but also beyond by reducing annular dimensions. Now, the second Pascal device is now brought up through the sheath into the right atrium. It comes out in an elongated fashion, is then closed. And after that, we steer down towards the tricuspid valve and also using on fluoroscopy the first device 
as a certain landmark. And the idea is now to go post-receptively from the first device. That means that on fluoroscopy, we have to be below the first device. Again, being above the tricuspid valve, the device is opened. The clasps are jacked again in case independent grasping is needed. That's the anterior leaflet. We cross the valve for the second device, even more so, always in a closed position. We then move closer to the first device, because this is where we want to, to end up with. The device is then opened, pulled back, thereby engaging the leaflets. And this is then confirmed on a transgastric view, making sure that we have this, the right clocking being 90 degree orthogony to the line of cooptation. And then the device is closed again in a mid shield view to make sure that we have both leaflets nicely in. The septal leaflet is, is, is seen very nicely. The anterior leaflet is moving in and out of plane a little bit, but still we see now when the device is closed, tension is brought on both leaflets. So here you can see that the anterior leaflet was still a little bit floppy. We open the device and try to get more leaflet in, which you can appreciate now on that echo view, especially on the right with the anterior leaflet nicely under tension. The device is then closed. Good appearance, both leaflets going in and out and appear to be under some tension, which is always a good sign indicating that there's enough leaflet tissue in. And as a result, we have even less TR than after the first implant and also after the first grasping of the second implant. Next question, with two devices being in, have we introduced some gradient where you can see that the mean gradient is only one millimeter of mercury, so not an issue. So in, in this case, we were able to implant two ACE devices, both in anthroceptal position and reducing a torrential tricuspid regurgitation down to mild without introducing any gradient and the patient was discharged the next day and is doing very well. Thank you. Philip, a beautiful presentation. Thanks so much. This was very educative uh, and, and beautiful pictures to see what you did. Um, so you used the ACE device. Um, any thoughts on this? Uh, do you prefer using the ACE device over the conventional Pascal in this case? Yeah, obviously we started off in the tricuspid valve with the with the conventional Pascal device, with the, with the larger device. But as soon as we had the uh, the the ACE available, we 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 switched to ACE in most cases, and this is mainly due to the fact that very often we have anatomies with a lot of cords, a very crowdy subvalvar apparatus, and uh, we find it easier to to maneuver and steer the device once you are below the tricuspid valve. In addition to that, in some cases, also imaging might be a little bit easier with the ACE device because you get less shattering. And then uh, thirdly, especially when you implant, want to implant two devices, sometimes the landing zone, especially on the sept leaflet, might be a little bit too small to accommodate two larger devices, whereas with two ACE devices, as also seen in this case, this is normally impossible. Um, Jörg, uh, what are your thoughts? I mean, the cooptation defect uh, Philip showed us was quite remarkable. Um, any thoughts on this? Would this, would this have been uh, a case for annuloplasty also? Or um, what, what do you think? I mean, it worked out beautifully. Um, well, it was really a brilliant case with a very nice result. Um, I'm confident that we, we already have with the annuloplasty system another device which works in many, many anatomies. Um, we only have to be careful that the tethering of the leaflets is not too severe for the analoplasty systems. There, the edge-to-edge -edge repair techniques appear to be more favorable. 
Um, so um, in at the bottom line, as I said, probably both both devices would have resulted in a perfect case, but you need to have these brilliant hands like Philip had to get these results. Otherwise, it's going to be difficult. Philip, how many Pascal devices do you need on average to treat torrential TR? Are there data? On, out? Average, on average, we implant two devices, sometimes three, sometimes one, but, but in most cases, two devices. And to some extent, although we do leaflet approximation, what we've done in that case is an indirect annuloplasty. We, we implanted two devices antraceptally, tried to pull over the RV free wall towards the septum and thereby reduce annular dimensions. Um, and that's just a, a, a different form of annuloplasty and um, from my point of view, a slightly um, easier modality. Which is, I think, important because what we also see is over the time a negative remodeling um, of the ventricle where even this effect is even more significant when the ventricle is getting smaller. Martin, one last question, quick answer, please. Um, what is the average gradient you would accept after annuloplasty or Pascal implantation in a patient? What is, what is difficult to accept? Well, actually, we haven't seen any gradient with annuloplasty so far in all the cases that we've done, more than 40 cases now. Um, if the gradient exceeds more than six, seven millimeters of mercury, I think this is something you should be really cautious. Okay. okay. Philip, thanks, thanks so much for this, uh, this beautiful presentation. And we move on with uh, Jörg Hausreiter's uh, presentation on the future of tricuspid repair and replacement. And we are eager to see what uh, Jörg has to show us. So thank you very much, Stefan. Dear colleagues, it's a pleasure for me to present you today the latest evidence on tricuspid uh, regurgitation treatment, what we have at present with the repair devices and what will be the future, but probably a combination of repair and replacement. And these are my disclosures. Um, as you have seen already very elegantly, um, is the Pascal device for treating tricuspid rotation. You have seen in the uh, live case the um, independent grasping um, possibilities with this device, which truly helps you to get a good leaflet capture and to optimize the leaflets. What you also have shown, and what I think is a very important feature, is the flexible 90 node construction of the Pascal device. And you see this here in this uh, Pascal device in the tricuspid valve, um, the continuous um, opening and closures with each heartbeat. So the uh, forces, the pulling forces on the leaflets are being well um, uh, captured and um, because they are so thin, there should be a, this should be a, a um, safety feature that we are preventing some leaflet damage. Um, we have already some data published on the early compassionate use of this device in the tricuspid valve. Um, these are the data presented in the Czech Interventions Journal and you see in this early experience we were able to reduce the tricuspid regurgitation um, from grade 3, 4 or 5, so severe massive or torrential tricuspid regurgitation in the majority of patients to um, tricuspid regurgitation grade 1 or 2 at one month and this was due in 85% of patients. We were also able to see that this um, device has also a significant impact on the annulus. Um, you see that the dimensions of the annulus was reduced from 47 to 40 millimeters, so around a 20% reduction in the annulus dimensions. Um, what has not been shown yet, so it's about the first time we're presenting this, is the one-year outcome of this population and what you can see on the left is a sustained clinical improvement after tricuspid Pascal repair with the majority of patients being in neurocard class one or two and you also see on the right side a significant improvement in the six minute walking distance um, at 12 months and these data are being 
just submitted for publication um, 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 very recently. We are also just started to collect some German um, commercial Pascal tricuspid data, and I'm happy to show you the, the ongoing data collection and analysis for the first um, 48 patients you see in this commercial experience. We also have treating patients with severe TR, majority had a functional um, TR with more than 80%. Uh, of interest, almost 20% had a pacemaker lead um, and the cooptation gap size was um, uh, about 0.7 centimeters. So there was a significant gap between the leaflets. Um, the patients were treated with almost um, 1.8 devices on, on, on mean um, and the majority of those devices um, went into the anteroceptal line of cooptation. Interestingly, the, this feature of independent leaflet grasping was used in almost 90% of patients. And when you now see again the 30-day results in this commercial experience, again, the majority of patients were in neurocard class 1 or 2 at 30-day follow-up. Correspondingly, we had a very good TR reduction, durable at 30 days, with the majority of patients being again in here uh, grade one or two, and uh, some also some uh, interesting initial data on the echocardiography uh, results. That again, the, there is a reduction in the tricuspid um, annulus dimensions, about uh, um, from 45 or 46 millimeters to 40 millimeters. So again, about a 15 millimeter, 50 percent reduction um, in the size of the annulus. Um, we also see that the size of the vena cava at follow-up was significantly reduced, indicating that we have less backflow, less hepatic congestion um, at follow-up, while the inflow gradient only increased um, about one um, millimeter of mercury from 1.2 to 2.3 millimeters of mercury at 30 days. Um, you might be wondering about the increase in the pulmonary artery pressure from 25 to 32 millimeters of mercury, but this is not a true increase in the pulmonary artery pressure, but it indicates the difficulties to assess the pulmonary artery pressure in the presence of severe TR at baseline uh, because of the missing valve function at that point and we were, you, you are not going to be able to assess the right ventricle to right, right atrial gradient correctly. Um, <clears throat> so the, on this basis, um, I would like to present you some, some long-term data um, of the patients which we treated in Munich. These are actually of this first compassionate use series, the first um, um, patients which we treated with the severe TR, you see in the second row, then the um, results at discharge, so significant TR reduction, and most of those patients are already um, back for a one or two year follow-up, and you see even after this long um, time, there's a significant durable TR reduction. Based on these very promising results, um, we have now four prospective randomized clinical trials investigating the clinical impact and efficacy of tricuspid edge-to-edge -edge repair. You see here in the middle of the class two TR trial, which is uh, mainly performed in the United States, but also on the right side, you see the, the German tricuspid, uh, the German um, tricuspid intervention in heart failure trial, a trial which we are um, about to initiate um, early in 2021. Um, this was about a little bit about the, the latest um, results from tricuspid repair using the Pascal system, but um, the, the science is going on and, and the development of new techniques, and you see here the Evoke valve replacement system, um, because tricuspid leaflet repair with an edge-to-edge -edge repair is surely a, a very important technique for 
many patients, but not for all. And there are some suboptimal anatomic features where an edge-to-edge -edge repair might not be a, an ideal technique. This, um, the, the following data, which I would like to show you, um, is about the first in human experience with this new evoke valve replacement system. So where we assess the feasibility and the safety also in the compassionate use setting. You see the evoke valve in the lower left and the 28 French evoke transfemoral system on the lower right. Um, while the movie on the right is showing you how this device, how the valve is being placed in the right ventricle in the tricuspid annulus um, and how it is being um, implanted, I would like to draw your uh, attention also to the data um, where this, this experience was, was um, collected in six institutions um, worldwide in Canada, US and to German sites in Mainz and Munich and 25 patients with severe TR. Now you have seen how this valve was placed in this video and how it is now beating very nicely in this movie. Um, the first 25 patients which were treated with this uh, valve in the compassion use setting are being presented here with their baseline characteristics. Um, the majority of patients were female, 88%, very um, symptomatic with 96% being in neurocarcass 3 or 4. Um, there were, um, the majority had a functional tricuspid regurgitation with 76%. And, and also of, of importance, uh, more than a third of patients had also pacemaker leads um, um, pre present in the tricuspid valve which was, but we were still able to place this valve in the tricuspid uh, space. Here are the procedural results. The technical success rate was very, very high in this early compassion use series, uh, already 92%. And the time to deliver this valve was only 68 minutes. So it took us about one hour to get this valve in place. Remarkable is truly the 30-day results. Um, in these 25 patients. One patient required um, 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 dialysis after implantation and two patients had some um, um, conduction system disturbances requiring a pacemaker implantation, but there was no mortality, no stroke, no myocardial infarction, no need for repeat intervention or um, um, any heart failure hospitalization. So very, very good result and this is also being mirrored by the tricuspid severity. You see the majority of patients were truly in massive or torrent had massive or torrential tricuspid regurgitation and with the valve um, implantation um, the TR was completely abolished in more than half of those patients grade 0, 56 percent so no TR and grade one in an additional 32%. So overall, you see that 88% of patients um, had a very significant and remarkable good result. And this translates again in a significant um, improvement in the New York Heart functional class at 30 day follow up. Of interest, you see the, the inflow gradient. Um, was also very very low with only 3.2 millimeters of mercury as a mean. Um, also here I would like to show you some of the examples which we treated um, of the patients we treated here in Munich, the first four patients again with severe TR um, in all those patients. Some of these patients were already seen now for follow-up and again you see here the trace or trivial uh, tricuspid regurgitation at follow-up at between two and 11 months after this evoke placement. So with this, I would like to conclude first that the Pascal repair system for tricuspid regurgitation has shown remarkable results in the first in human experience with a sustained reduction of tricuspid regurgitation at 30 days with 85% of patients having a TR of grade two or less. 
This translated into a significant clinical improvement, um, and this improvement was durable at the one year follow up. There's an ongoing analysis of the early com German commercial experience, and this experience confirms the promising results which we have seen in this compassion to series. Second, and I think this is going to be truly the one, one important step in the future, is the evoke valve replacement system for tricuspid rehabilitation. You have seen in this early um, compassion due series that it uses um, a completely percutaneous approach for the valve implantation. But for sure, we need future studies to evaluate the safety, the performance, the efficacy, and lastly, also the patient selection, which will profit most from either the repair technique or the replacement. With this, I would like to thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Yeah, thanks so much. Perfect uh, presentation and very impressive results. I mean, um, looking at 25 patients being treated with a valve and tricuspid position and you have zero mortality, um, are we doing better than in the mitral space here? Why is this the case? It's a matter oh, of patient selection? Oh. This is certainly due to patient selection. Um, in this early phase, we were, of course, very, very careful um, to select patients which will have a, probably a good result where the valve can be placed safely. But overall, this also shows you that um, valve replacement is feasible with this new technique and probably we can expand these initial promising um, results to a larger patient population. What is, what is key? I mean, one could be afraid in patients who have deteriorated right ventricular function to put in a valve. Um, any thoughts on this? Um, assessment of the right ventricle is of course very, very important. We have not used uh, this type of valve in patients with very, very depressed right ventricular function. Um, we also have to uh, um, look at this in more detail in the future because assessing right ventricular function by TAPSI or the fractional air change is probably not sufficient and probably this my uh, opinion at least is that we're going to need to have 3D um, um, RV assessment to really as, uh, to get a good um, value of the function of the uh, right ventricle. What about the incidence of pacemaker implantation in, in your cohort? You showed an 8% incidence for doing so. Is this something of concern, putting in a valve? Um, it might be a little bit of concern um, um, because, of course, we are pressing a little bit on the AB node, and this can result in, in some problems. I was actually surprised that we only had these two cases where we needed a later um, pacemaker. Um, so I think this looks very, very promising. And can you put a, a valve into a patient who has already a lead in the right ventricle? But this is what we have shown in this uh, series. Um, almost a third of those patients um, had the pacemaker lead in in, uh, in the in the tricuspid valve. So this is possible, yes. And many of those patients which we treated had some uh, lead induced TR, which is not and they're not feasible for an edge to edge repair. Okay. I'm afraid. I guess we have to finish this session. I have to. Uh, say thank you to all of you um, participating. Uh, thank you for giving these talks. I think we witnessed uh, the introduction of three really fascinating technologies to treat tricuspid regurgitation by annuloplasty, a valve, or by uh, leaflet repair. Uh, we've been uh, exposed to data showing the clinical safety and efficacy of these devices, which I think is astonishing. And um, most of all, I think we, the field can be fascinated about the fact that we will have randomized data in the future and we may be more successful in getting them in sooner time as uh, for the mitral valves. So we will see what we will do with uh, these techniques, not only with respect to symptomatic improvement, but also uh, with respect to um, uh, the overall um, um, uh, um, prognosis of, of these uh, severely diseased patients. And with this, I want to thank you once again. Uh, enjoy the meeting and uh, see you soon.